Every day Vesper came to see him, and he looked forward to these visits with excitement. She talked happily of her adventures of the day before, her explorations down the coast and the restaurants where she had eaten. She kept an eye on the repairs to the Bentley which had been towed down to the coach builders at Rouen, and she even arranged for some new clothes to be sent out from Bond's London flat. Nothing survived from his original wardrobe. Every stitch had been cut to ribbons in the search for the forty million francs. He found he could speak to her easily, and he was surprised. With enjoyable steps, Bond recovered. He was allowed up. Then he was allowed to sit in the garden. Then he could go for a short walk. Then for a long drive. And then the afternoon came when the doctor appeared on a flying visit from Paris and pronounced him well again. His clothes were brought round by Vesper. Farewells were exchanged with the nurses, and a hired car drove them away. It was three weeks from the day when he had been on the edge of death, and now it was July, and the hot summer shimmered down the coast and out to sea. Bond clasped the moment to him. Who are you? Bond. James Bond. I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War. Shaken, but not stirred. 007 reporting for duty. These are the 00 Files. Welcome to the podcast of the 00 Files. My name is Don, and today we are going to finish our thorough book review of Casino Royale, written by Ian Fleming and published in 1953. You know, Tyler, I actually found that Fleming, when he pronounced this title, he would say Casino Royal. Oh. And we always say Casino Royale, but maybe he was just wrong, probably. <laughs> yeah, our French is probably better than his. Let's, let's well, keep maybe, it at that. Yeah. Well, anyway, since I already talked to you, you know that I won't be doing this by myself. With me is a friendly middle-aged man with dark brown hair brushed straight back, particularly large white teeth and a black patch over one eye. Not tied with a tape across the eye, but screwed in like a monocle. It's Tyler! How are you doing, Tyler? I'm doing great. I wouldn't have recognized myself, but yeah, that that should be me. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, you work for Smirsh if I describe you like that, but yeah. You no, know. mm, oh well, to each his own. Okay, good. So last week we went through chapters ten till eighteen of Casino Royal or Royale. Now I don't know what to say. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm just gonna say Royale because yeah, I'm used to that. Yeah. How are you looking back on that second part of the book? It's really the the meat and potatoes of the book, isn't it? It's really where where all the most of the action happens. Yeah, it's almost like the climax lies somewhere in the middle of the book. So yeah, I I, I really enjoyed that part, and I really enjoyed recording the the podcast with you as well. Ah, uh, great. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I, I really like it too. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to go in depth and start analyzing every little sentence and what is Bond doing and why is he doing that. But man, it's thorough. So. <laughs> But yeah, me, uh, me too. I really liked it. And, and I really distinctly remember the tension in the middle of the book. What you said, it's like, this is the meat and potatoes of the entire book. We have the card game, then we have a car chase, then a crash and a capture and a torture and an assassination. And it just kept on going and going and going. And it got my heart beating and I just wanted to keep on reading and reading. Oh man, it was great. And I believe that we talked a bit about... Fleming's obsession with torture. Yes. So I went online. A healthy obsession. Yeah, a healthy ob Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I found a, uh, an interview with the man himself, Ian Fleming, on YouTube, uh, recorded back in 1963, and he briefly responds to all the violence and torture in his novels. So let's listen to Mr. Fleming. Taking the charge of sadism first, your, your torture scenes are pretty beastly in some of the books. Well, I don't know how many of you read, but... Um... Of course, they're nothing to what they really are in real life. And I think the old days of the hero getting a crack over the head with a cricket stump have rather gone out. I mean, we all have become considerably wiser since the last war. And I've tried to bring very similitude into these books. And um, it's certainly true that, that um, the critics have occasionally found them uh, pretty strong meat. Yeah. What effect do you think these themes have on, on, on the average reader? Are they going to give him unhealthy ideas or is this vicarious violence a harmless way of sublimating aggressive tendencies? 
Well, I think that's a way of putting it. Uh, but I was brought up on what we used to call fourpenny horrors, and um, I can't remember that any of the excitements ever did me any harm. Um, all history is sex and violence, mm. and I think it's ridiculous to go on writing thrillers in the old Bulldog Drummond, John Buchan uh, way when life has uh, come out so fast past us. Well, first thing that I notice is that last week I tried to sound like Fleming and I sound absolutely nothing like him. <laughs> but yeah, what do you make of this? Well, I, I, I think he's on the nose here. He hits a nail on the head. Probably isn't like it, it is in real life. And yeah, well, it's, it's, it's part of espionage. Yeah. So why not use it? Yeah. If you compare it to something like 24 nowadays, or years past already, but a, a, a series like 24 or the Jack Reacher novels, that took it a step further as well. So it's just a continuation on that foot, I think. Yeah, it pretty much she says, don't make such a big deal out of it. That's just the way it is. Yeah, it's part of life, so it's part of my books. Mm. Now he less. uses this very difficult word. Let me try to pronounce it. Very similitude. And I obviously had to look it up. I don't know if you know what it what it means, but according to Google, it means the appearance of being true or real. All right. Okay. So he tries right. to make his book as real as possible. But yeah, yeah, it ties in with something that we mentioned last week that Fleming likes to write in his book that he literally writes, this is not some sort of fictional story in which the hero is suddenly rescued at the last yeah. moment. So yeah. stylistically, he likes to place his adventures in the real world, even though they're fiction. So, yeah, almost, <laughs> almost making fun of thriller novels themselves. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So last week we also briefly talked about Smirsh, and I looked up some more information on this organization. So this is what I found on the website from Course Hero Book Analysis. Though it is fictionalized in Fleming's Bond novels, Smirsh actually existed. Its full name was the third main directorate for counterintelligence of the People's Commissariat of Defense. Catchy title. Yeah, that's a fancy title, yeah. <laughs> Which uh, dictator Joseph Stalin nicknamed Schmert Spionem, meaning death to spies. It was established in 1943, so that's right in the middle of the Second World War. And it was the important tactical and operational arm of the Soviet secret intelligence community during the Second World War. And its main task was oppressing political resistance within the Soviet government and the military. And by the time the department was disbanded in 1946, it had neutralized over 30,000 terrorists and spies. Man, I'm glad I wasn't living in Russia during the Second World War. What about you? Well, as I read it, it's mostly an internal affairs department. So yeah. most of the, the killings were, were in Russia themselves, right? Or in the Soviet Union themselves. Yeah, it's, it's a, um, if I understand it correctly, it's about preventing Russians working against Russia. Yeah. And who knows how many of them were actually spies or just political opponents that need to be... Exterminated. Get rid, got rid of. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I don't know. But it, it kind of feels like you could sell out your neighbor or anyone that you just didn't like. It's, it's, it's a very suspicious society, or at least that's how it reads. Yeah, well, let's not say anything negative about Russia. That's <laughs> 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 we might get into trouble with that. So you never know who's listening. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You never know who's listening. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Who's that? There's a guy coming in, and he has a mask yes, on. Yes, right. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Quickly, move on. <laughs> so, um, also last week, I mentioned the book Ian Fleming's James Bond: Annotations and Chronologies for Ian Fleming's Bond Stories, written by John Griswold. And like I said, I would. I went through the chapter on Casino Royale. But there wasn't really much on these last nine chapters. It's mostly about how European casinos work or worked back in the day, the specific timeline of the events that occur, and how to convert all that old money stuff into current currency. But I feel like we've covered most of that already in our past two uh, episodes. What do you think? Yeah, I think so as well. Yeah. So I did find other stuff, though. So before we're going to continue with uh, chapters 19 till 27, I want to take a look at how this book, Casino Royale, was published 
and received. And it's quite an interesting story. I've, I found a description in a book called The Man with the Golden Typewriter, which is edited by Fergus Fleming. He's both a historian and he's Ian Fleming's nephew. Now, this book was published in 2016, so it's quite recent. Do you know it? I know of the existence of the book, okay. but I haven't read it yet. Okay, well, I can really recommend the book. It's a fascinating read. So we're going to listen to a clip from that. I just finished the last Raymond Benson novel. So now I have time for all these uh, non-fiction Bond, uh, ah, Bond books. Good, good, good. Yeah. I can wholeheartedly recommend it. Yeah. So let's listen to a clip. Fleming was faintly appalled. I did nothing with the manuscript, he wrote. I was too ashamed. No publisher would want it, and if they did, I would not have the face to see it in print. Even under a pseudonym, someone would bleak the ghastly fact that it was I who had written this adolescent tripe. Instead, he busied himself with publishing matters. As a wedding present, his employer, Lord Kemsley, had appointed him managing director of a new imprint, Queen Anne Press. He delighted in the role. Okay, so that obviously wasn't Fleming that you just heard. It's uh, the audiobook is narrated by Julian Reint Tut. But what do you think? He wrote the book and he did nothing with it. Well, I think we, we all recognize this, right? You do something and you put a bit of your heart and soul in it. And when it's finished, you think, oh, no, I'm never going to show this to anyone. Yeah, this is rubbish. I'll just keep this for myself and throw it away <laughs> or, or whatever. I will keep it somewhere in a, in a hidden folder on my, uh, on my computer. And that's about it. So I think this is quite recognizable for people who uh, whoever wrote something or uh, wrote a song or something like that. So yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine too. So he went to Jamaica in January 52 and then he finished his manuscript in February 52, but he doesn't do anything with it. But then finally in May, you know, let just let it simmer for a few months. Things have been brewing for a while. And then he carefully starts probing the possibilities. Yeah, but that, that also explains why I, I believe it was last uh, last week or the week before that that we were discussing that the novel is set in 1951. Yeah. Uh, I believe. So that's probably the reason why it feels more than a year ago or more than two years ago. Yeah, it actually, yeah, well, when you start writing in 52 or January 52, you start writing about events of the last year. So it's set yeah, in the summer of 51. Still very recent. Most likely. But yeah, yeah. So let's see how this process went. His approach was oblique. Over lunch at the Ivy restaurant with his friend, William Plumer, who happened also to be a reader for Jonathan Cape's publishing house, he asked him how to get cigarette smoke out of a woman once you had got it in. All right, he said. This woman inhales, takes a deep lungful of smoke, draws deeply on her cigarette, anything you like, that's easy. But how do you get it out of her again? Exhales is a lifeless word. Puffs it out is silly. What can you make her do? Plumer, himself a novelist, looked at him sharply. You've written a book. Fleming pooh-poohed the idea, saying it was hardly a book, merely a boy's own paper story, but was grateful when Plumer asked to see the manuscript. All the same, it took several months and a reminder from Plumer before he actually sent it off. He forced Cape to publish it, Fleming wrote. And it was true. Although the decision was eventually carried by a majority, Plumer pushed it through in the face of strong opposition. Jonathan Cape disliked thrillers in general, and his editorial director, Michael Howard, was repelled by this one in particular. I thought its cynical brutality, unrelieved by humour, revealed a sadistic fantasy that was deeply shocking. OK. So, it seems like we were lucky to get the book at all. Like, um, it was nearly not published. Yeah, it's one of those stories that's also in, uh, in Raymond Benson's Bedside Companion. And because of that, you always, when you do end up on a sentence like, uh, and she, she let the smoke escape through her nostrils, it's like, ah, so that might be the one. <laughs> what he was talking about. The one line that he was referring yeah. to. Yeah, we didn't get the novel. Or we might have not gotten a novel, yeah. What what would have happened? What would the world have looked well, like Well, nothing then? really. Nothing would have no. happened. That's exactly it. No. Yeah. But luckily, finally, in 53, Casino Royale was published by Jonathan Cape. But how did it sell? And how was it received at the time? 
So also from this book, The Man with the Golden Typewriter, we get a letter that Fleming wrote himself to the editorial director of Jonathan Cape, who was called Michael Howard. That was that man that we just listened to that didn't like the book, who found it to be deeply shocking. Now let's listen to what Fleming wrote to dear Michael. To Michael Howard, 30 Bedford Square, London, WC1. Casino Royale came out on the 13th of April, not, as Fleming had hoped, on the 15th of April to coincide with the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, an Easter launch that would set the pattern for all future Bond books. The first print run of 5,000 copies sold out within a month, and as Cape geared up for a second run of 2,000, which went equally swiftly, Fleming exhorted them to print even more. 22nd of April, 1953 Dear Mr. Howard, In the course of the innumerable editions of Casino Royale, which will now, I presume, flow from your presses, could you please correct a rather attractive misprint on page 96, line 13, and make the Ace of Spaces into the Ace of Spades? Incidentally, although I know this won't ring anybody's withers, a friend of mine told me this afternoon that he had tried three bookshops, including Hatchards, and that they had all run out of the book. Of course, it is better this way than that their shelves should be bulging with unsaleable dozens, but, as I told Jonathan, obviously it is no good getting plenty of reviews if the book is not available. So please tell Jonathan, with my compliments, that he might as well swallow his pride and print the 10,000 he originally said he would. Well, what do you think? Well, it's no use writing a book, having it become popular, and then not being able to sell any, so, yeah. But this was all in the in the UK, right? It was yeah. Was this is only in the UK. In the, yeah. yeah. To me, but I might misread it because our culture is slightly different than the UK culture 60, 70 years ago. I think this is quite a a, a cocky letter that Fleming is. Uh, he starts by asking them to correct a minor spelling mistake, but then mm. very understated, he tells them, "Please print more of my book now, you idiot." I told you so, that this was going to be a bestseller. But Jonathan Cape, yeah. they didn't want to print 10,000 copies to begin with. And they were slowly drip-feeding the book to the market. Yeah, well, hindsight is always twenty twenty, And I mean, Fleming, I can understand that why they were a bit hesitant. It wouldn't be the first time that a, uh, a publisher would end up with boxes full of unsold novels. <laughs> so... Okay, yeah. better safe than sorry, you say. Better safe than sorry. And nowadays, a first-run Casino Royale novel is worth a lot of money because of it. So. Yeah, really? I got a bunch of those uh, back in my uh, bookcase. Yeah, no, really? No, 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 no. No, <laughs> okay. no. No, Sadly, no, and no. I, I can understand that Fleming is a bit, well, see, I told you so, but that's always in hindsight. So. Yeah, okay, that's true. Oh, that's true. However, I do think that a famous song would have been different if it would have been called the Ace of Space <laughs> by Motorhead, but never mind. Okay, so to get a better perspective on how the book was critically received, let's listen to a couple of audio clips from the book Goldeneye, where Bond was born, Ian Fleming's Jamaica. That was written by another historian, Matthew Parker, and published in 2015. And we also used his book for part one, uh, what we recorded two weeks ago. As a journalist, Fleming was well placed to encourage reviews of the book. His own newspaper, the Sunday Times, declared him the best new thriller writer since Eric Ambler. Although there were complaints about the graphic torture scene, most reviews were favourable. In the Daily Telegraph, John Betjeman declared that Ian Fleming has discovered the secret of narrative art, the reader had to go on reading. Alan Ross in the TLS called the novel an extremely engaging affair, with his greatest praise for the high poetry with which he invests the green bays lagoons of the casino tables. The Manchester Guardian called it a first-rate thriller with a breathtaking plot. Anne's brother Hugo, who had ambitions as a novelist himself, was unimpressed, telling his sister Mary Rose that Ian's thriller starts well but ends as the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in print. Torture such as Japs and Huns is stewed as not cricket. I always knew he was neurotic and tangled. So it's mostly good reviews. But his brother-in-law's not impressed. Maybe he's jealous, but I don't know. <laughs> ah, that's brother-in-law's for you. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. But his book is out there. It's selling well. He has good reviews. 
But unfortunately, his brother-in-law is not the only one who didn't really like it. Remember, for instance, the editorial director of Jonathan Cape, Michael Howard. And then there's also this analysis by Matthew Parker, who wrote the book GoldenEye, and he says the following. But while Casino Royale launches a recognisable bond and a recognisable style, it remains somehow different from the rest of the novels. It is at times clunky in its exposition and has an unsatisfactory structure with an overlong coda after the gruesome climax of the action. But it also has a claustrophobic tension not experienced again until the much later books. It is rawer and less polished than later Bond novels, as perhaps we should expect of a first attempt, but at the same time it seems more nuanced and subtle than much of what would follow. So this audiobook is narrated by Rory Macmillan, and do you recognize what he's saying here? Do you agree? Yeah, mostly. Mostly. It, it, it reads a bit more like a, like a first draft than the other novels do. However, especially regarding the fifth audio clip that we listened to, that Fleming effect of wanting to read through and, and wanting to continue reading, that's really prevalent in this novel. Well, especially the middle section, I think, what we discussed last week. Yeah, true. But true. the part that we're going to go to now is pretty clunky in exposition. Yeah. Especially the first uh, few chapters of what we're about to put our teeth into. Do you think there's an unsatisfactory structure? Well, the screenwriters of, of Casino Royale certainly did, because they felt it necessary to put in the sinking house scene at the end. To end up with a to end with a with a big finale. I think it fits the novel quite well, actually. I think it sets up Bond to be the agent that he is becoming after this novel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that might also just be the difference between a book written in the fifties and the film made in the two thousands. Yeah, and it's it's not like nothing happens because also in the in the final few chapters there's still a bit of tension and mm -hmm. and what's about to happen who is this guy what is he doing there what's up with vesper so there's still a bit of mystery and and suspense along the way but it's not as fast-paced or exciting as the the middle part mm. okay so last week we stopped after chapter 18 which was just described as being the gruesome climax in which le chiffre is assassinated by a hitman from smirsh and Bond is marked with a thin stiletto by the killer who leaves his mark. A sort of inverted M, or a very blocky straight W, whatever way you want to look at it. Which is the Russian letter SH for SPION, meaning spy, obviously. And then Bond faints, and the assassin leaves. So now we get to the overlong coda. <clears throat> Are you ready to go to chapter 19? I am. Okay. So this chapter is called The White Tent, and basically in this chapter Bond awakes in a French hospital and we are informed what has happened between when he was nearly left for dead in Le Chiffre's villa and now. So Fleming starts the chapter with the lovely line, you are about to awake when you dream that you are dreaming. Did you ever have that yourself? Yeah, yeah, I have. That you dream that you're dreaming? I have the most vivid dreams there are. So yeah, I, I sometimes I'm like, but wait, this isn't possible. I'm, pro I'm probably dreaming and then you wake up. Oh, yeah. wow, that's like Inception, man. <laughs> oh, well. I always forget my dreams. I, I don't know. Maybe it's something wrong with me. Anyway, two days have passed since the torture and Bond is continually drifting in and out of sleep. He has nightmares, he is flinging his arms, he's very restless and he's speaking violently. And then his whole body is strapped down and something like a large white coffin covers him from chest to feet. So that explains the chapter title. But finally, luckily, Bond calms down and when he awakes on the third day, it is a beautiful day and he hears garden sounds and waves at the beach and he turns around and he sees a pretty nurse. Ah, what a comforting image this is. I would love to wake up like that. I think it's funny that they flew in an English nurse. Yeah, it is. Because obviously you can't trust the French, right? No, you can never trust the French, even though they're very clever. <laughs> But this is Nurse Gibson. She was indeed sent over from England to look after him. And Bond is in a nursing home in France still. So he is in Royale. And while Nurse Gibson is collecting the doctor, Bond mentally checks his body. And he feels that his wrists and his ankles hurt, probably because his arms and legs were tied down to protect himself. And also to protect the nurse and the doctor, because they don't want to get hit. And the back of his right hand obviously hurts, where the Smirsch assassin cut him quite badly. 
and he can't feel anything in the center of his body, as Fleming describes it, probably a local anesthetic, he assumes. So then the nurse comes back in together with the doctor and René Maty. Now the doctor is a young Frenchman with an intelligent face and he is probably called Mr. Exposition because in just a few paragraphs he explains everything that has happened so far. So let's listen to some of his story. You have been here about two days, continued the doctor. Your car was found by a farmer on the way to market in Royal and he informed the police. After some delay, Monsieur Matisse heard that it was your car, and he immediately went to Les Noctambules with his men. You and Le Chiffre were found, and also your friend Miss Lind, who was unharmed, and according to her account suffered no molestation. She was prostrated with shock, but is now fully recovered and is at her hotel. She has been instructed by her superiors in London to stay at Royal under your orders until you are sufficiently recovered to go back to England. So I think it's interesting to note that apparently... Nothing has happened to Vesper while they were captured. And that's quite remarkable because she is a very desirable woman. But the two henchmen didn't touch her. No, but she's a colleague of them, right? So Yeah, but Bond doesn't know that. No, Bond doesn't know that. But but we're assumed to believe in, in and, the and end. You should, yeah, you shouldn't know that either, yet. <laughs> no, true, true. <laughs> but in the end, we yeah. find out that... that she uh, she's just a colleague of them. I mean, she's in on the she's in on the plot. Yeah, they're probably just having a cup of tea. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but I yeah, if you read this for the first time, it's kind of remarkable. It's like, okay, why wouldn't yeah, they? Well, they're very professional henchmen. I mean, not every henchman should be a rapist. That's true. That's a good point, actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are, there are some nice and polite civilized henchmen. <laughs> Okay, the good doctor that explains that they found the bodies of the henchmen with a single point thirty five bullet in the back of their skull and Le Chiffre with a bullet between his eyes. This is exactly what happened in the film when he falls down with the third eye. I like that. The doctor then comforts Bond by telling him that he was hurt very badly, but he will fully recover. What a relief! He says, none of the functions of your body will be impaired. Thank heavens, I think. <laughs> Yeah, what I do like when he makes up the nurse is like, I've never heard such so much dreadful language in my life. I like that. Yeah, it makes you wonder what he said. Yeah. Bond says that he was maltreated for about an hour, so we now know how long the torture went on for. And the doctor congratulates him on surviving. Most men would have died, obviously, from that kind of torture. And then the doctor leaves and he gives Mati only 10 minutes to talk to Bond. He doesn't like it. Bond needs his rest, but still, he uh, knows that it's important also for Bond and for Mati to speak to each other. And I really like this next paragraph of Mati's story. I have a personal message from M. He spoke to me himself on the telephone. He simply said to tell you that he is much impressed. I asked if that was all, and he said, Well, tell him that the Treasury is greatly relieved. Then he rang off. Bond grinned with pleasure. What most warmed him was that M himself should have rung up Matisse. This was quite unheard of. The very existence of M, let alone his identity, was never admitted. He could imagine the flutter this must have caused in the ultra-security-minded organization in London. What do you make of that? Well, it is high praise for Bond uh, and for Matisse as well, uh, being called by M. But M, M is still a bit of an enigma, so we don't, yeah. don't really know what he's like and what he does and what his role is in the entire story. So I don't make too much of it. I mean, he's, he's still a bit of a, of a ghost a specter uh, in the background. He is. But that's what I found fascinating, because now M is almost as well known as Bond. You know, in the films, if you look at James mm -hmm. Bond, he goes somewhere and everybody knows who he is. And it doesn't seem like they're trying to hide who M is. But in this paragraph, they write that the very existence of M, his identity, was never even admitted so it's like the guy doesn't exist. He is a ghost. No, on the other hand, in From Russia with Love, we we see that the Russians know exactly who he is. Yeah. So I think over the course of a few books, Fleming was changing all that. Like he's not very consistent himself either when he's writing. There are many changes that went into the inner workings of MI6. And he was maybe still searching for how he wanted to describe his characters. But 
I find yeah. this. But the book M was never was never really known to the general public. What do you mean by that? Well, M in the books isn't a isn't a public figure. No, he isn't. No. So when he goes to Blade, for instance, people know that people at Blades know that he does something with intelligence, something at the Ministry of Defense, but it's all very hush hush. And... Yeah, yeah, which is good. I think this is good. Uh, yeah. But also, I like the impression it makes on Bond because Bond seems like a son, and he feels so thrilled that his father is proud of him. That yeah. that is nice. It, it thoroughly established that relationship. Hi, this is Don from the future. I um, I apologize for breaking into the audio feed, but I really want to add a little tidbit of information here. I am currently editing this podcast and listening to Tyler and myself talking about the character of M being unknown to the general public. Well, just this morning I was reading a few pages in Ian Fleming's James Bond Annotations and Chronologies for Ian Fleming's Bond Stories by John Griswold. You know, the book I also mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, and I told Tyler there wasn't much of interest on these last nine chapters. Well... Apparently, I was wrong. Griswold briefly describes quite some very interesting details on what was known about the Secret Service to the general public. On page 14, he writes, Because of the British Official Secrets Act, Fleming could not state that Bond worked for MI6 or under the Foreign Office. MI6 is currently a name commonly used for the British Secret Intelligence Service that is under the auspices of the Foreign Office Ministry, not the Ministry of Defence. But it appears that this information did not become public knowledge until the late 1960s, possibly not until the publication of Kim Philby's autobiography, My Silent War, in 1968. The British government officially acknowledged MI6's existence with the Intelligence Services Act in December 1994. So, according to Griswold, it really kind of makes sense when Fleming wrote that the very existence of M, let alone his identity, was never admitted. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Back to the podcast. <laughs> So Bond explains to Mati what happened to him and it drains his energy when he has to relive the whole nightmare. And then Mati has just one final question. Where did you hide the check? Now, what about the money? Where is it? Where did you hide it? We too have been over your room with a tooth comb. It isn't there. Bond grinned. It is, he said, more or less. On the door of each room there is a small square of black plastic with the number of the room on it. On the corridor side, of course. When Lighter left me that night, I simply opened the door and unscrewed my number plate and put the folded check underneath it and screwed the plate back. It'll still be there. He smiled. I'm glad there's something the stupid English can teach the clever French. Matisse laughed delightedly. Now you really like this uh, part, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I, I just think it's a clever way of hiding the check, and we get a glimpsey when he is hiding it, so we know he does something with the door, but not we don't quite know what it is. And here we get the conclusion of what it was that he was doing uh, yeah. with his screwdriver. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. So, but I don't only find the the hiding place uh, fun to read because that was clever, but I also like uh, the relationship between Bond and Mati, the banter that they have, and uh, yeah, yeah, they're sure. good they're solid the friends. French. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then it's a, immediately a throwback to uh, w when Mati told him about the Munsters in the beginning. We are so clever, we know all these things. Um, yes. And then Bond says, I'll get you for that, you French scum. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. No, it's, it's, a, nice, uh, it's a nice little in, uh, go between. Yeah. Between so, do you have anything else on this chapter? No, not really. It sets up the rest. I mean, Bond wakes up and gets the good news that he will recover fully, but it will just take some time. Yeah. Just one thing. Imagine that you are a nurse uh, being flown in from England, and the first thing you have to do is administer a local anesthetic to Bond's balls. <laughs> I mean, welcome to France. Here, this is your job for the next couple of weeks. Good luck uh, with that. Well, it might be okay if you just uh, put the needle somewhere in the stomach. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, probably. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I have that image in my head, Tyler. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll probably get a lot of more images in our head uh, along the way. Okay. So let's quickly ready for move just on. Uh, the chapter, this chapter ends with the doctor, he returns and he's mad as hell because he can see Bond is uh, drained and he throws Mati out. Yeah, I believe you, you even hear Mati uh, laughing the, on the hallway, right? Yeah, when he's leaving, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so chapter 20 is the nature of evil. And before we start, I think this is one of the most, this is a chapter where we get a lot of character development from Bond and Mati as well. So I, I wonder what your thoughts are on this, but I'll, I'll give a quick summary first. Bond makes good progress with his, with his recovery. Every day he gets a little better. And after a few days, Mati comes by again. They talk about the way the Smirsh agents got in and out of France without being caught. And Bond mentions that he probably got reprimanded for not shooting Bond as well. I think that's fun, um, seeing a Russian agent come back home and it's like, oh, there was a was a British spider as well. Um, well, you didn't shoot him? him <laughs> I left him alive. Oh, you <laughs> idiot. So he's probably dead now as well. He probably came from Leningrad to Berlin via Warsaw, said Bond. From Berlin, they've got plenty of routes open to the rest of Europe. He's back home by now being told off for not shooting me too. I fancy they've got quite a file on me in view of one or two of the jobs M's given me since the war. He obviously thought he was being smart enough, cutting his initial in my hand. They discuss the wound on Bond's hand, and Mati thinks that it doesn't mean anything. Bond is quite sure that it resembles the Russian letter SH, short for SHPION, spy. And Bond expects M to tell him that he has to get new skin grafted on the back of his hand. However, Bond tells Matisse that he's ready to resign, so it doesn't matter anyway. And he explains to Mati that... When I was being beaten up, I suddenly liked the idea of being alive. Hmm. This sounds very interesting to me because you hear this very often. For instance, when people survive a, a car accident hmm. or something like that, suddenly they have the feeling that they got a second lease on life and they are going to really live their life for all it's worth uh, instead of just going along with the flow. Yeah. So what's your take on this? Uh, do you know of a situation in Fleming's life where he came within an inch of his life that he used for this passage? Or, Oh, you know, I really, I haven't really delved into Fleming's life that much yet. Um, last week, we used a clip from that TV show, Fleming, but that was highly dramatized. I don't know if Fleming even went on actual missions or if he was ever really in danger so I'm, I'm sorry i don't don't have a good answer to that and and i never experienced a near death experience myself luckily that's i think that's a good thing but yeah but it sounds it's, it sounds sort of like a, a what people get when they have a midlife crisis mm. okay now now is the time i've got a second chance and now is the time to uh, to grasp it yeah exactly yeah exactly. what i found interesting about this bit slightly before the whole I'm glad to be alive is Bond briefly mentions his time before this mission two jobs first I thought that he meant his missions to become a double O but then mm -hmm. later I thought that these are two other missions because he explains uh, Mati extensively about his two missions he had to do to become a double O but it, it gives you the idea that Bond has been part of the Secret Service for quite a while uh, and he's slowly working up the ranks and he's been like a regular spy or whatever and now after his two missions to become a double O he is licensed to kill but he has a long history yeah and I can understand he wants to get out especially after your balls were beaten for an hour by Le Chiffre yeah I can understand that yeah, yeah. Well, we get this great discussion between Bond and Mati. Yeah. That's also used in the movie Quantum of Solence. It is, yeah. About the hero and the villain. It starts with Bond describing, well, I always read it as uh, describing how he got his double O uh, by killing a Japanese cipher expert in New York and a double agent in Stockholm. For those two jobs, I was awarded a double O number in the service. Felt pretty clever and got a reputation for being good and tough. A double O number in our service means you've had to kill a chap in cold blood in the course of some job. Now, he looked up again at Matisse. That's all very fine. The hero kills two villains. But when the hero, Le Chief, starts to kill the villain Bond, and the villain Bond knows he isn't a villain at all, you see the other side of the medal. The villains and heroes get all mixed up. Matisse has a different 
approach. He almost thinks that Bond is a bit crazy. So he calms him down and explains to him that there are a lot more evil guys in the world and that he doesn't like the idea of Smirsh running around in France uh, killing people. Mm -hmm. And he compares Bond to a Chinese box. It takes a very long time to get to the center of them. Yeah. And they continue discussing God and the devil and how Le Chiffre created a form of evil that made it necessary for a, an equal amount of goodness to exist. And I always get the feeling that at this point, Mathie gets a bit annoyed with Bond. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think he really likes it. Yeah, but I also think that, that that's somewhere along the way he's like, all right, but man, you are the good guy here. You got your balls bobbled by Le Chiffre. He's an evil man. He goes around, Smurfs goes around killing people left and right. Stop whining and just be a secret agent. Just be a spy. And I'm not sure if, if he's really worried about Bond resigning. I think he's quite confident that things will turn out fine. But Bond just needs his time. He's just been through a very big ordeal. And his body is recovering, but also his mind needs recovering. And when Mati is explaining things like that, like there will be plenty of other Le Chiffres, plenty of other bad men. Yeah. You will come around because that's just the way you are. That's the way you're programmed. And that's pretty much how the end of the chapter goes, I think. It's almost like asking an actor who just finished a movie if he wants to return for another one. I would rather slash my wrists. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. But so that I'll doesn't mean that's weeks. true. Yeah. But give him time, yeah. But I really like, I like you, I like the dialogue because mm -hmm. the, both of them are not afraid to speak their mind and I think they sharpen each other's thoughts as well. It's a good dialogue. It's really about life in general. Why do we do what we do? And I, I really like it that they don't agree. But neither of them is really wrong, I think. No, no, no. I don't think so either. But I, I love the, the motto that Mati leaves him with. Surround yourself with human beings, my dear James. They are a lot easier to fight for than principles. Yeah. I love that part. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that one. Yeah. And then he, he mentions that Bond is machine-like. Yeah. But at the same time, it is also a strange conclusion. Don't you think? Don't become too human. I mean, Bond is showing just how human he is, how conflicted he is. Yeah, and how he, he's got a lot of doubts. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, well, Mati also sees him as a very useful spy. Yeah, he's very good at what he does. You probably have to leave your emotions out of the equation if you want to be an effective spy. So mm -hmm. I can see where he's coming from. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can too. Matisse opened the door and stopped on the threshold. Surround yourself with human beings, my dear James. They are easier to fight for than principles. He laughed. But don't let me down and become human yourself. We would lose such a wonderful machine. With a wave of the hand, he shut the door. A few more thoughts that I had when I read this chapter. What I like is the part where Bond relates his two missions he needed to do to become a double O. I find that Fleming gold for some reason. Whenever I, I come to that section, it's like, oh, I want to soak this up. I want to know what happened. What did he do? Like you mentioned, he had the two kills, one in uh, New York, which was nice and clean with the sniper gun. And then the mm -hmm. second in Stockholm uh, in Sweden uh, with a knife, very close and, and gruesome. It's not explained elaborately. But I don't know if you read it already, Forever in a yeah. Day, but Anthony yeah. Horowitz. And that's a wonderful chapter. And we read what happens. <laughs> okay. It's future Don again. And again, I'm breaking into the audio feed. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. This is messy podcasting. And I really should have prepared this podcast better. It's just that. Since recording my chat with Tyler, I've been reading more and more in John Griswold's massive James Bond encyclopedia, and he just unearthed all this lovely background information, which I really appreciate. So, again, here's an extra snippet from Ian Fleming's James Bond annotations and chronologies for Ian Fleming's Bond stories, this time on Bond's two missions to become a double O. In the book He Only Lived Twice, the obituary for James Bond states that he began working at a branch of what was subsequently to become the Ministry of Defense. 
the statement that Bond began working at a branch that was transformed into something else is of interest when two World War II events in Bond's life are added to the mix. These events are mentioned in Casino Royale. In New York, Bond killed a Japanese cipher expert who was cracking British coded messages in Rockefeller Center's RCA building. And in Stockholm, Sweden, Bond killed a Norwegian agent who was doubling against Great Britain for the Germans. These two events seem to trace back to similar activities performed by the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, during World War II. The SOE contained elements Fleming required for Bond's secret service, with his establishment of direct and indirect relationships in other countries and the British colonies. SOE's primary role was to sabotage and subversion against Nazi Germany and Japan in the countries impacted by these two aggressors during World War II. Griswold then quotes from the autobiography of William Stevenson, who ran the British Security Coordination, or BSC, for British intelligence in the United States. The Japanese Consul General was located on the floor below the BSC in New York's Rockefeller Center. With two of his assistants, Stevenson broke into the Japanese consular offices at three in the morning and Fleming came as an onlooker. They cracked the safe and borrowed the code books long enough to microfilm them. So there you have it. Fleming was at least involved himself with one of the two missions he has Bond do, even though he highly dramatized the actual event for his hero. Well, I can't really blame him. And according to Griswold's timeline, it's very likely that Bond, at the age of 19, began his Secret Service career at the SOE. All right, that's all I wanted to add. Back to the podcast. <laughs> And now we also know what the number 007 means, yeah. which is necessary, I think, to, to understand what it means. I thought about a tiny quote from uh, Die Another Day when I read this. It's not often that Die Another Day comes to mind, really. But I, I like this quote by Raoul. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Yeah, just look at the living daylight in today's light. Exactly, and, uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, Bond is right when he's saying that I'm as much a villain as Le Chiffre. It all depends on your perspective. Yeah, sure. Well, we already talked about the dialogue. What I would really love to do is uh, listen to that part of Quantum of Solace, what you already mentioned, that Mathis is mm -hmm. uh, saying these lines when he's in his beautiful villa in Italy, because I just love his voice. <laughs> so let's, let's just listen to that. And MI6 run out of plastic. My lordly, right now, you're the only person I think I can trust. That is odd. But I guess when one's young, it seems very easy to distinguish between right and wrong. But as one gets older, it becomes more difficult. The villains and the heroes get all mixed up. I, I completely agree with you, Tyler. This is a great chapter to evolve their relationship and their personality. Yeah, and it, it reminds me a bit of... because. It's, it's really an insight into, into Bond's psyche, I think. You see his doubts, you see the way he thinks about things, and you see this a number of times in, in the novels, but usually when he's in a, in, on a plane. Yeah, that's For true. some reason, that is the moment where Fleming has Bond ponder his life and, and ponder the decisions that he's made so far. Uh, well, he has plenty of time to kill. Yeah, but I, I, I love this chapter, but... Mati leaves him with the motto that I just gave you. Surround yourself with human beings. Uh, they are a lot easier to fight for than principles. Yeah. Unfortunately, most people around Bond will die eventually, pretty quickly. So <laughs> maybe a few principles wouldn't be, wouldn't be that bad. <laughs> Ready for the next chapter? Okay, let's go to chapter 21, Vesper. The next day, after this lovely conversation with Mati, Bond wants to see Vesper. And he hasn't seen her for about a week. And he didn't want to see her. So she sent him some flowers a couple of times, but Bond always had the nurse give them away to another patient. Bond had not meant to offend her. He disliked having feminine things around him. Flowers seemed to ask for recognition of the person who had sent them, 
to be constantly transmitting a message of sympathy and affection. Bond found this irksome. He disliked being cosseted. It gave him claustrophobia. Personally, I find this funny. I don't know if this is Bond speaking or Fleming, but I agree 100% to this. I can't stand flowers. I hate being given flowers. <laughs> my mom tends to give me flowers for my birthday and... I really had to tell her, don't give me flowers. I don't want them. I don't like them. I, I think they're stupid and they start decaying the moment you put them in a vase or vase. I don't know what is the British anyway, but yeah. I have two cats that love flowers. So by the time I put them in a vase, they get eaten. <laughs> the only place that I can, can display flowers are on top of the highest. Uh, oh, that's a good place to, to put them. So, yeah. yeah, just yeah. let them grow in the wild. Anyway, yeah. Bond is slowly turning into the bastard again that we all love, or we all love to hate. And Fleming writes that Bond is feeling bored to have to explain all these things to Vesper, and he wants to ask her some questions about her behavior. But these will make her seem incompetent, and he doesn't want her to lose her job. But there is, most importantly, another reason Bond postponed seeing Vesper again. And now, when he could see her again, he was afraid. Afraid that his senses and his body would not respond to her sensual beauty. Afraid that he would feel no stir of desire and that his blood would stay cool. So basically Bond wants to have sex with Vesper ever since they met. He even describes how in the car when they were captured his eroticism had been hotly aroused by the sight of her indecent nakedness. Uh, that is just, oh, that's just stupid, I think. I mean, if you're captured after a car crash, is that really what you think about? If you're tied down? You don't know what adrenaline does to you, but, <laughs> well, I think he has more important things on his mind, but, well. well apparently he hasn't, no. Uh, no. But he's just afraid that he can't perform anymore sexually. And this is what is most important to Bond, his manliness. He wants to know if he still has it. Is it... This is his mojo. <laughs> yeah, on, on the other hand, he has a hot nurse with him all the time, so he should be able yeah, to... That's true, find... that's true. But he's he's very attracted to Vesper. Yeah. And he's postponing it because he's dreading to find out what if he can't perform anymore. But now he also knows that he can't postpone meeting her any longer because he has to eventually write his report. So finally, on the eighth day, he asks for her in the early morning and she comes in happily through the door and she stands smiling at him, a tall bronzed girl in a cream-colored silk frock with a black belt, and she looks absolutely splendid. It's not really fair, is it, what happened to the both of them? I mean, oh, well. He, he drew the, the short stick, I think. <laughs> it's like when, when meeting your ex-girlfriend somewhere uh, in the streets. You always hope that you are wearing your best suit and, and looking all, uh, all <laughs> tall and handsome and she's walking around in jogging pants and, and on Crocs. But that's probably the same here. Yeah, unfortunately, um, Vesper looks splendid and Bond is uh, completely knackered. But she yeah. explains to him that she's been bathing daily at a wonderful stretch of sand down the coast and that she'd love to take Bond there too. Should do him some good probably, according to the doctor as well. Bond grunted. God knows when I'll be able to bathe, he said. The doctor's talking through his hat. And when I can bathe, it would probably be better for me to bathe alone for a bit. I don't want to frighten anybody. Apart from anything else. He glanced pointedly down the bed. My body's a mass of scars and bruises. But you enjoy yourself. There's no reason why you shouldn't enjoy yourself. So there's the rebuff. What a cheerful man Bond is. <laughs> Well, Vesper does the only thing she's pretty good at. She starts crying. Yeah. And through her sobs, she's telling Bond how sorry she is, how everything is her fault. Now, do you think she's manipulating Bond here? I'm not sure. I think she's just she just finds it difficult to keep her mask on. And then crying helps as a facade. No, not 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 really. But she, she I mean, she has a role to play. Yeah. And sometimes you see a few cracks in her armor. Hmm. She has no armor left. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about clunky writing. Okay, let's not go there. But as we now know, because we've read the book before several times, everything really is her fault. So she should feel guilty, I think. Yeah. But as always, the sobs seem to do the trick because Bond relents and he tells Vesper he'd love to go to the beach with her. 
Now, is he talking with his brain or with his penis, you think? I'm not sure, but he relents here. But he also, at the start of the chapter, he already decided not to pose her any difficult or, or hard questions hmm. because it would make her feel incompetent. So he already is He's protecting quite her. unprofessional. Yeah. Yeah. But he does try to ask a few things that he has to know. So they make some small talk. Uh, about what the press is writing, about the epic gambling match. Then finally Bond confronts her with his first difficult question. Like, what really happened to you after you left me in the nightclub? All I saw was the actual kidnapping. And then Vesper is kind of vague. She tells him she wasn't thinking clearly, that she didn't know how Mati usually works. She admits to being easily tricked and manhandled into the car. But she feels proud that she managed to throw her hand back out of the car and she hoped that it would be of meaning to Bond. But uh, Bond knows that it was him that they'd been after and that if Vesper hadn't thrown her bag out, they would probably have thrown it out themselves directly after they saw him appear on the steps. But he doesn't say this to Vesper. Why not? Why is he so gentle? Again, because he doesn't want to make her feel incompetent okay. or something. I just think he, he wants to pretend that he's a nice guy because he still wants to sleep with her. That's Probably. what I think. Yeah. But anyway, he asks his second difficult question. Why didn't you make any sign when they finally got me after the car smash? When he spoke to her. He was dreadfully worried, Fleming wrote. He was afraid they might knock her out or something. And then Vesper again says, well, probably unconscious or something. It's just, oh, there's nothing there. She's so frustratingly... She just gives these non-comments that you can't do anything with. No, on the other hand, it does play into the narrative that she was in shock. I mean, you, you usually don't know what you've been doing or what, what really happened to you when you were in shock. It's just one big blur. So that kind of works for the story for now. Yeah. Okay. So finally, Bond wants to know if she was messed about. But Vesper says she was pretty much left to her own devices. She didn't really see anything. She slept most of the time until Mati burst in in the morning. She did hear a scream once, though, and she starts crying again, bumbling how everything is her fault. And then Bond immediately comforts her. She really has him wrapped around her finger. Yeah, he tells her it's all in the past. Everything is forgotten. I can't believe you really forgive me. And she promised to make it up to him somehow. Well, Bob definitely knows what she could do to make it up to him. Yes, let's barter with sex. Yeah, yeah. So they look at each other, they smile, they both know what the promise is. And Vesper leaves probably to do some more sunbathing or whatever. Yeah. What do you make of this chapter? A uh, seed of doubt is sown hmm? here. And Bond really doesn't understand why Vesper doesn't just answer the questions that he poses to her. But Vesper has something that Bond wants, so he doesn't seem to make too big of an issue about it yeah it's awkward though it's awkward yeah i really get the feeling that she's still playing him but in a way she's also genuine i don't know we'll get to that at the end i think uh, she describes in her letter when she decided not to cooperate with uh, with uh, smirch anymore but mm. it's yeah it's, it's, I just find it funny that whenever she becomes emotional, he's right there to protect her and to say everything will be okay. Yeah, what I don't understand is why is Bond falling for her here? It's not like, I mean, she's not, she isn't really girlfriend material, right? Well, she's, obviously know, we don't know what she looks like. We only have... Sobbing, uh, incompetent agent bumbling about. But, yeah. well... Who knows? Yeah. She I, is very hot if we have to... Uh... This is their first meeting. Things will still develop from here. Yeah. Um, I found an analysis online and it says the following. During their conversation, Bond misinterprets her lack of eye contact as embarrassment for getting kidnapped. But she's not embarrassed. She's lying. And she can't bring herself to look him in the eye. Neither readers nor Bond know this until the end of the novel when Vesper finally confesses her role as a double agent. <gasps> but Bond, the celebrated spy who pays attention to every detail, never suspects Vesper of duplicity. He underestimates her because of her gender, which ends up being more painful than his miscalculations about Le Chiffre and his men. Now, this is a fair point to me. I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the same in the film when Bond tells Vesper, everybody has a tell, everybody except you. And he is so wrong. <laughs> yeah. And, well, she's a lady, so she can't have any real involvement in the plot or... Probably, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. just there to look pretty and hand him a check. Yeah. 
Sadly, we don't get any mentions of what Bond can do with his little finger in the book. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Quickly, let's move on to chapter 22. Yes, chapter 22, the hastening saloon. So Bond is recovering, and while doing so, he is writing his report to M. And although he has his doubts about the way that Vesper handled herself, he writes in his report that she was very brave and very cool. So, in a way, Bond is lying to M yes. uh, to cut Vesper some slack. Yeah. And I'm very surprised by this. Yes. I don't think Bond would do this in any of the later books. He isn't really a professional here, right? No, it, it is I mean, unforgivable, really. Yeah, why would he save Vesper's face in front of M? I mean, she's first of all, she's not working for M directly. And she's incapable or incompetent. She's incompetent and she... Well, I, I just don't understand this. And I don't think it really fits with the bond we come to know. No, well, I don't think he does that anymore after this book because of what happens in this book, because he is betrayed. That, yeah, that, that's what this whole yeah. book is about. Yeah, but why would he do it in the first place? I mean, it's like he's been a professional for, for years, like you said. Yeah, true. And all of a sudden, a lady with black hair and a big mouth comes by and he makes him forget all his... Yeah, maybe he never considered the possibility of a young, beautiful woman being a double. Mm. Could be. Could have been a blind spot. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. probably. So Vesper is regularly visiting Bond, yeah. and they mostly make small talk, uh, yeah. because Vesper, well, Vesper tells him some funny stories about Head of S, and what it's like working there, but they do not discuss the Le Chiffre episode anymore. I read that she tells how he, she was transferred from the WRNS the Rens. Yes. Do you know what that is? The Women's Royal Naval Service. Yeah, I had to look this up yeah. uh, on Wikipedia. But it comes back in several other of the Bond books as well. I, I think it was John Gardner uses the Rens sometimes for other Bond allies or Bond girls. So I've, I've read the um, description before or the WRNS. But apparently it was the women's branch of United Kingdom's Royal Navy which was formed for the First World War and then disbanded and then revived for the Second World War. All hands on deck when you really need everyone to show up. Yeah, but I think it's really clever and uh, it's, it shows a, a great deal of professionalism. I think that was John Gardner in one of his books where Bond describes the, a Wren to be a very capable uh, female operative. Okay. Well, so they, they just make a lot of small talk and Bond is surprised how, how easily he speaks with Vesper. Yeah. They get to know each other a bit more. And Fleming also describes Bond and probably his own view on relationships. With most women, his manner was a mixture of taciturnity and passion. The lengthy approaches to a seduction bored him almost as much as the subsequent mess of disentanglement. He found something grisly in the inevitability of the pattern of each affair. The conventional parabola, sentiment, the touch of the hand, the kiss, the passionate kiss, the feel of the body the climax in the bed, then more bed, then less bed, then the boredom, the tears, and the final bitterness was to him shameful and hypocritical. Even more he shunned the mise-en-scene for each of these acts in the play, the meeting at a party, the restaurant, the taxi, his flat, her flat, then the weekend by the sea, then the flats again, then the furtive alibis, and the final angry farewell on some doorstep in the rain. God, this man is harsh. Yeah. <laughs> you think he has some failed relationships, right? <laughs> yeah, he, does. he certainly does. But I, I think it's, it's a nice summary of most failed relationships. So he, he does that very well. So Bond gets better and better, and he's allowed to, to get out of bed, then into the garden, then out for a drive. And finally, three weeks after he was almost beaten to death, He's released from the hospital. Yay! Yes. Now, I remember that I was surprised that his recovery took just three weeks. Yeah. Because reading these last few chapters made it seem like it was at least three months, if not more. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Yeah, for some reason, his recovery felt a lot longer than it actually was. Yeah. Probably that's just me, but... So, probably he got the mission in May. Then two weeks later, when the book starts, he is in Royal. That's just a few days, right? Or about a week. And then by the time he gets out of the hospital, it is July. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. And we get another week or something. Yeah, just a few days. It's uh, very dense. So they are driving towards the place that Vesper found for them. 
and they are passing the spot where Bones Bentley's tires got slashed by Le Chiffre's carpet of spikes. Yeah. Vesper is fidgety the entire drive. She's looking in the mirror all the time, being very, very nervous. And because she has the idea that they are being followed by another car. Yeah. And Bond brushes it off like, well, probably nothing, but I'll humor you. Let's let's stop here for a while. So he, he tells the driver to stop for a while. And indeed, a saloon is passing and takes a particular interest in them. Mm-hmm. Well, Bond thinks nothing of it. He, he gets a bit annoyed by her. Like, well, the, the guy is just driving around here. He was probably looking at that sign. It's nothing. It's just a coincidence. This mission is over. Everything is taken care of. Don't worry so much. Yeah, but Vesper is convinced that they're being followed. Yeah, but I don't, I don't understand it because on the one hand, she's... Well, she's still playing her part. If she is playing her part, don't say anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just tell him that you're getting car sick or whatever. Or I, I don't really understand it, but yeah. she's she's still playing her part. Doesn't want to tell what's going on, but obviously shows that something is wrong. But they arrive at a nice little inn by the sea, the the one that Vesper found them, and Bond loves it right away. Makes some small talk with the proprietors. And again, the first seeds of distrust are sown. Yes. Something is going to happen over the next few chapters. We can be sure it's not going to be uh, happily ever after. We just don't know what it is yet. And, well, you said that you don't have that Fleming effect in this part of the story, but... Well, if you, if, if you, by Fleming effect, you mean that you want to keep reading on because the chapter ends on a cliffhanger and you just want to know what happens next, then I think it's less in these chapters. Each chapter is kind of nicely ended and you think, okay, I could now, after this chapter, I could put my marker in it and uh, go to bed and continue reading tomorrow. Yeah. It's, it's easier that way. Yeah, it's not as high octane as the But what I do like it is that in pretty much every chapter, there's this sentence, the incident leaves a tiny question mark hanging in the air. Mm. And that slowly adds up to another tiny question mark and another tiny question mark. And you keep on thinking, what is going on here? What is true and what isn't? So I like that part of it. I don't know if that's also Fleming-esque, but we'll discuss that at the end of this uh, this book. Sure. So yeah, we finish at the end. Yes. Right? So they are at L'Auberge du Fruit Défendu. Mais oui. Or something like that, which is the Inn of the Forbidden Fruit. Ah, right. Yeah, it's kind of a strange name, I think. But then again, I'm not French. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, and the place is run by Monsieur et Madame Versois. And yeah. what I really like is that Fleming paints these characters vividly with only a few sentences. One is a war veteran with one arm and a chubby, handsome wife. That's pretty much all you need to know. Now I know what they look like. Yeah, They're very affectionate. Yeah, again, he is probably very competent at what he does and yeah. she's just being pretty. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, and also what is important, especially in the last chapter, is that Fleming describes the layout of their rooms. The proprietor showed them to their rooms. Vespers was a double room and Bond was next door, at the corner of the house, with one window looking out to sea and another with a view of the distant arm of the bay. There was a bathroom between them. Everything was spotless and sparsely comfortable. So we find out that the rooms are attached uh, with a bathroom in between them. That is uh, important if you want to know what happens later on. But yeah, I, I, when I was reading this, I really thought that Fleming was slowly trying to dull me into sleep. It's a very nicely written chapter, but it just flows along. I don't know exactly where it's going. That's funny because I, I really get the feeling, what, what's up with this girl? Aren't you just annoyed with her? Maybe a bit of both. Yeah, maybe a bit of both. Apparently, over the past few days, when Bond was strapped to his bed, he was forced to talk to her and couldn't just have sex with her. So he was forced to get to know her. And all of a sudden, <laughs> he thinks that he's falling in love with her. But yeah, yeah, I just find, well, to use a Fleming expression, she's just a silly bitch. <laughs> right. But maybe I'm just being mean here. I don't know. Well, tight of passion? Sure. Chapter 23. Bond is horny. As soon as the proprietor leaves, he grabs Vesper and they kiss. And I believe this is the first physical contact they have in the entire book. Now, Fleming is quite visual when he describes these kinds of scenes. Is this what you call pulp or is it just cheap porn? I don't know. Let's, uh, let's listen to a small part of what Fleming writes. My darling, he said. 
He plunged his mouth down onto hers, forcing her teeth apart with his tongue, and feeling her own tongue working at first shyly, then more passionately. He slipped his hands down to her swelling buttocks and gripped them fiercely, pressing the centres of their bodies together. Panting, she slipped her mouth away from his, and they clung together while he rubbed his cheek against hers and felt her hard breasts pressing into him. Then he reached up and seized her hair and bent her head back until he could kiss her again. She pushed him away and sank back exhausted onto the bed. For a moment they looked at each other hungrily. So Bond is definitely up for it. But Vesper breaks away and she asks for a cigarette and she stands at the window looking outside with her back towards Bond. And Bond walks over, he stands behind her and he places his hands over each breast and they fill his hands and the nipples are hard against his fingers. So there's some more male fantasies going on here. But Vesper's really not in the mood. She just wants him to go bathing so she can unpack and prepare for dinner. Now, this next bit I find is really sad. He walked over to the door and looked back. She had not moved. For some reason he thought she was crying. He took a step towards her and then realized that there was nothing to say between them then. There was nothing to say between them. That's really sad. No, oh, it's time for action. Yeah, or time to go your separate ways. Mm. If you can't talk to each other anymore. Yeah, they have something to get out of the way first, I think. I, I, I always read it like that. Okay. Well, Bond does something that I wouldn't do. He just goes along with it. He goes to his room. He puts on his white linen bathing drawers. You know, Fleming is very specific when he describes these things. A dark blue pajama suit. Yep. And then I don't know if Fleming hates pajamas or Bond, but apparently they are horrible. But Bond has a special kimono-like pajama coat from Hong Kong. And it is absolutely divine. Now, probably Fleming just enjoyed it himself. I don't know. Probably. Yeah. So, Bond has a lovely evening swim. He lets himself dry on the hard sand of the beach while the sun is setting. And he takes off his bathing trunks, so he's completely naked. And then he notices there are hardly any traces left of the torture. And he starts thinking about Vesper. And he finds it confusing. Which it is! Just leave already, man! But, you know, <laughs> he, he, at least he's being honest with himself. All he wants was to have uh, sex with her uh, and then after a while dump her. But now, you know, she's crept under his skin, apparently, and his feelings have somehow changed. And he really likes her companionship. And he likes it that she has hidden depths and that she won't share those with anyone else. And he also found out that after the kiss, he knows that she can be extremely sensual. Because he forced a kiss on her and she cut him off straight away. No, well, but it's the, the second before that. Ah, right. All right. But he, he describes it as um, she would surrender herself avidly and greedily enjoy all the intimacies of the bed, but she would never allow herself to be possessed. I don't know. Maybe he's overcomplicating things, but... Yeah, and then we get the... Fleming giving us an insight into making love to Vesper, right? Yeah. What do you think of this? The conquest of her body, which each time have the sweet tang of rape. Yes. Well, we get a line like that in The Spy Love Me as well, right? Yeah, at the end of The Spy Love Me. Yeah. yeah. That comes across as quite startling, <laughs> uh, yes. to put it mildly. But um, this is what a website wrote on this. As the novel's protagonist, Bond is positioned as the book's hero. And it seems odd to have a character the reader is supposed to envy wax poetic about rape. Yes, it does. It is quite strange, yeah. But there are a few things to keep in mind here. First, Casino Royale was written in the early 50s, before the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. So rape was fine then? Was it? <laughs> I don't think so. But I, I, I really, I don't know anything about this. Well, I do know there is a, a handbook for housewives, some written somewhere in the 50s, I believe. Yeah. And it states that as a woman, it's your job to, well, just lie there and make sure he finishes as soon as possible. Well, if that was sex in the 50s, then we've come a long way, I guess. Yeah. Luckily, we have. L luckily, also for us, that there never in, in any of the books Bond is being described as a rapist. 
no, we get that in the movies. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Goldfinger. I, I don't know. If yeah, I, I, I can't make excuses. I won't make excuses. But I also thought was that there are people that think that Bond needs all his vices, you know, the alcohol, the cigarettes, the women, because of his line of work. He's a pretty fucked up person to begin with. Sure. Yeah, that's why I don't envy Bond. I, it's yeah. Not, I, we all want to be Bond and we all... So what I find strange is that with all the ambiguity going on there and Vesper pretty much, whenever she doesn't know what to say, she starts crying. She's also being described to being pretty much the perfect woman doesn't make any sense to me but i don't have to understand or agree with everything i guess so when it's finally dark or nearly dark bond finally gets up and he goes back to the hotel and the last sentence of this chapter is at last at that moment his mind was made up what do you think that means yeah i really think that this works towards him asking her to marry him yeah always read it like that yeah he doesn't do it yet well he does it Teasingly, yeah, he still waits for the actual question because he wants some more confirmation or something, which we'll get in chapter twenty-four. Three yes, défendu. She can run a bath, so marry her. Okay, <laughs> uh, chapter twenty-four. Fruit défendu. Like you just said, the forbidden fruit. Bond returns to his room and he finds all his stuff unpacked. I would hate this myself. <laughs> I. I pack my own bags and I unpack my own bags and I, would, I, I wouldn't like it if hotel staff would, would unpack my, my suitcases for instance. What about your girlfriend though? No, my girlfriend shouldn't do that either. Oh, okay. And Bond is surprised to find a bottle of sleeping pills of, on her side of the bathroom. Yeah. Well, he, he thinks that probably the whole episode with Le Chiffre shook her a bit more than he, uh, than he initially thought. Which is strange because with all the crying he should know by now that it, that it really had an effect on her. But mm -hmm. well, and Vesper also filled the bath for him, and Bond jokingly asks her to marry him. Vesper, he called. Yes? You really are the limit. You make me feel like an expensive gigolo. I was told to look after you. I'm only doing what I was told. Darling, the bath's absolutely right. Will you marry me? She snorted. You need a slave, not a wife. I want you... Well, I want my lobster and champagne, so hurry up. All right, all right, said Bond. Bond takes a bath, gets dressed, and they go downstairs to have dinner. Of course, they have champagne, lots of it. Yeah. And liver pâté, and lobster, and strawberries with cream, and life is good in France. Yeah. I can honestly say, Fleming really loves describing these things. What yeah. they eat, what they drink, what they have, what it looks like. I like these little things. So, before dessert, Vesper sighs that she doesn't deserve all of this great food, and that, that, she's feel, that she feels spoiled by Bond. And Bond is a bit surprised by her seriousness. They discuss how they don't know all that much about each other. Well, to Bond, it's well, we know enough for today and for tomorrow and for the day after that. And Vesper then says something that holds a lot of truth for me. Uh, she says, people are like islands. Vesper looked at him thoughtfully. People are islands, she said. They don't really touch. However close they are, they're really quite separate. Even if they've been married for 50 years. Well, with all the pop and with all the, the soft porn that, that Fleming writes, he also writes sentences like this. And I, I kind of like him for that. Yeah, do you agree with him? People are islands? Yeah, I do. I do. In the end, you're still by yourself. Yeah. Uh, even if you're in a loving relationship for years, it's still... In the end, you're, you're alone in your own mind. Mm. Yes, you really live in your own head. Yeah. And you, can't, yeah. you are constantly talking to yourself, your inner dialogue. Yeah, and you can share an awful lot with each other, which is good. But there are always parts of you that are just yours. Mm. And I, I like the way he uh, he explains that, or he has Vesper explain that. It's a good uh, metaphor, people are islands. Yeah, I think so. Don't Bond proposes to become a peninsula or something like yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's quite a good line. Yeah. Mm. And Bond, Bond is scared that she's going to be a melancholic drunk. Yeah, um, the worst. Somewhere in one of the novels, Fleming explains the different types of drunks. Yeah, there are four the, types. Yeah, the and violent drunks. I think drunk, it melancholy. was uh, with the crest. I think it was the Hildebrand yeah. rarity. It might yeah, have been. Absolutely. might have been another yeah. short yeah. story. Wow, you have that encyclopedic knowledge that Bond has on, on things. Mm. Yeah. Well, obviously, I was wrong. 
It wasn't the Hildebrand rarity, but it was a short story and even from the same collection, so I was quite close. But this section appears in the story Octopussy and here you can listen to a tiny snippet of that read by Tom Hiddleston. Heavy drinkers veer towards an exaggeration of their basic temperaments. The classic four. Sanguine, phlegmatic, choleric and melancholic. The sanguine drunk goes gay to the point of hysteria and idiocy. The phlegmatic sinks into a morass of sullen gloom. The choleric is the fighting drunk of the cartoonists, who spends much of his life in prison for smashing people and things, and the melancholic succumbs to self-pity, mawkishness and tears. Well, there you go. The more you know. All right, back to the podcast. <laughs> Well, Bond is scared that she's going to be uh, of the melancholic type. But Vesper changes her tone, tells Bond that her islands feel very close to uh, her island feels very close to his tonight. <laughs> and indeed, Bond <laughs> Bond proposes to make a peninsula together. Yeah. So they finish their desserts, they have their coffee, they have their brandy, and Vesper goes upstairs to her room. Uh, Bond stays downstairs for a while to smoke a cigarette and then follows her upstairs when he sees the light in her room goes off. There we go! Yes! Bond does what Bond does best. And the next morning he goes out for a swim again. Walking back after his swim, Bond decides today he's going to ask Vesper to marry him. Yeah. What I really found strange is that in the evening he goes to her room and they finally have sex. And then at dawn, Bond awakes in his own room. Yeah. At dawn. I looked this up. In July, in Dieppe, dawn is around 6 a.m. So after they had sex, Bond thinks, okay, that was good. Now I'm going to sleep in my own bed again. It's easier that way or more comfortable that way. I got what I came for. <laughs> might might have been that they have single beds. I don't know. Mm, you mean just one bed in one room? Yeah. But then still, you can... Just a single bed, I mean... If you're romantic, you can still both spend the night there. Yeah, there was a time, but I, I'm not sure. He does it a couple of times. They, they or usually maybe up. after they had sex, he had to go out to pee in the middle of the night. And because it was that late, he thought, well, I might as well go back to my own room. Or he didn't even remember what room he came from. And he accidentally went back to his own room. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but in Diamonds Are Forever, Tiffany does it as well. She goes back to her own cabin. Hmm. Queen Elizabeth. So it's probably a thing of that time that you maybe just maybe that's just what you do. Yeah, you had a fuck bed and a sleep bed, something like yeah, that. Maybe. What I liked about this chapter is the beginning after the extensive, elaborate food descriptions. <laughs> is that that yeah. is where the foreplay begins? I really like that. Is when you know you both know what you want, and you agree on that. And then Fleming writes all through the meal they left unspoken their feelings for each other. But in Vesper's eyes, as much as in Bond's, there was excited anticipation of the night and they let their hands and their feet touch from time to time as if to ease the tension in their bodies. That feeling, that is so wonderful. You get all warm inside and it's like the anticipation of sex. On the other hand, she goes upstairs saying that she's tired. So isn't that just an excuse? Is that like the telephone voice you use for someone who's listening in? For instance, the, the two, yeah, what, what, what were they called? Uh -huh. the, yeah. What, yeah. What were they called? Monsieur et Madame Versois. It's like, I'm tired now. I'll yes. go upstairs. <laughs> and Vaughn is like, okay, you do that. I'll just have a cigarette out here. <laughs> it might be just <laughs> that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably. All right. All right. Yeah. You got me there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just play acting. Oh, oh, I'm so tired. Yes, I'm going upstairs to lie on my bed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, probably. So the next morning, Bond, like you said, he goes back to the beach in his weird pajama coat. And he really likes walking around naked. And I think they yep. did this quite well in the film when we have you have him sitting in his hotel naked all the time. This is something that really belongs in the Fleming book. So I like it that they, they copied that. This is yeah. something I personally hate, but maybe you like it. He goes into the water until it's below his chin, and then he holds his breath and he sinks down, feeling the cold water comb his body and his hair. I would never do that. I don't like the sea water. It's just too salty and uh, I don't like it, but I'm just weird that way. 
Do you like swimming in the sea? Yeah, I usually jump straight in. Yeah? Yeah. Not too cold or anything? No, uh, depends. I wouldn't do it right now, but when yeah. in France in July, I probably would. Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, because last summer we were in Sardinia, in the Mediterranean, and it was perfect weather. And we were there for two weeks, and I only went for a swim once or twice, maybe. I don't know. I'm just weird that way, I guess. <laughs> Not my. No, thing. I would. I would make use of the of the time. Uh, yeah. Well, that was what my wife and kids did. They were swimming every day, pretty All much. Right. But I was well, just. Not your thing, then. Yeah. Don't go far. Maybe I have to give it another go. Uh, we'll see. And then this chapter confirms what my suspicions were. At the ending of last chapter, when Bond looks up into the sky and mm. again, it says he concludes he will ask Vesper to marry him. Yeah. So it's kind of like he was already thinking that and then he just wanted to wait to confirm his suspicions. Maybe he wants to try her out in the sack. I don't know. <laughs> See if she's any good. Yeah, probably. Try before <laughs> you buy. <laughs> uh, okay, chapter 25, Black Patch. This is a long chapter. Yeah, this is this is also the chapter that I miss in the movie. This is the part where Vesper on the boat in Venice sees the man with a black glass of his glasses, right? Mm. And then she looks again and he's disappeared. Yeah. And that's but it. this is where the relationship really falls apart. Yes. Yes. And it literally says that. We'll get to that. So All right. Bond re enters the hotel and as soon as he walks in, it's early in the morning still. He is surprised to see Vesper emerging from the glass front of telephone booth and she wants to go up the stairs towards their rooms. Now, obviously, this book is written well before mobile phones and we have to assume that the inn doesn't have telephones in each separate room. Or maybe Vesper needed to make a call as she didn't want to use the phone in her own room. I don't know. Or maybe she was called at the inn, at the reception. I don't know. I think it's just one phone for the entire hotel. Very likely, yeah. yeah. She had to yeah. use the telephone booth near the front door and Bond sees her coming out of the booth and he calls her name. And then Vesper takes just a moment longer than necessary staring at Bond and he becomes slightly troubled something might be up. And then Vesper lies. Oh, she said breathlessly. You made me jump. It was only... I was just telephoning to Matisse. To Matisse, she repeated. I wondered if he could get me another frock. You know, from that girlfriend I told you about. The Vendeurs. You see... She talked quickly, her words coming out in a persuasive jumble. I've really got nothing to wear. I thought I'd catch him at home before he went to the office. I don't know my friend's telephone number and I thought it would be a surprise for you. I didn't want you to hear me moving and wake you up. Is the water nice? Have you bathed? You ought to have waited for me. I find it very strange that Bond seems to accept her answer at first. You know, he, he puts her erratic behavior down to feeling guilty over this childish mystery and he just wants to have breakfast. So Yeah, and it's such an obvious lie. It's very obvious, yeah. Yeah. But again, maybe because she's a woman, it's probably just silliness. He has no idea, no clue whatsoever that she might pose any threat whatsoever. No, she's not yeah. capable of being any threat or something. It's yeah. it's it's really is strange, but Yeah, it is. It is what it is. But he accepts that she is um, troubled by something. He wants to comfort her. He puts his arm around her, but she disengages herself and she moves quickly on up the stairs. And then Vesper tries to repair some of the damage, telling she was very surprised to see Bond. And he looked like a ghost. You have to imagine that, like a drowned man with the wet hair coming down over his eyes. And she gives an uncomfortable laugh. And then Bond suspects that something is amiss and he wants to both spank her and for her to tell the truth. But he gives her just a reassuring pat on the back and tells her to hurry up. The trouble with lying is that most people just talk too much when they do it. They mm. give too many details. They give too much of an explanation. So that that's what happens here. Instead of just letting it be what it is, she tries to give him another explanation and... and... Things get worse. Yeah. And this... This is what you just said. This is, the, for me, the most confronting paragraph of this chapter. Maybe even of this entire third act. I don't know. That was the end of the integrity of their love. The succeeding days were a shambles of falseness and hypocrisy, mingled with her tears and moments of animal passion, to which she abandoned herself with a greed made indecent by the hollowness of their days. This makes me feel so sad. Mm. And at the same time, it is 
for me, quite easily recognizable. Because so often we don't really say what we mean, or we are afraid to confront the other, or we don't want to hurt the other, or we are afraid to get hurt ourselves. So we rather keep pretending everything is fine, mm. even though we both know things aren't. And, uh, you know, it can only last for so long before eventually everything erupts like a volcano. I do think Bond tries, though. He does try to talk about things. He keeps bringing up the phone call, but Vesper keeps to her story and adds to her lies exactly what you said. You just keep making things worse. Yeah. And then she starts accusing Bond of thinking she has another lover. Ha! I think this is a very smart move. It's Lance Armstrong uh, defense. Yeah. Just start accusing other people. Yeah. And just screaming to, the, uh, to them. Yeah. Yeah. And then she starts crying again. Another smart move. Uh-huh. Uh, Fleming writes, Each day the atmosphere becomes more hateful. Yeah. And Bond is clueless. What the hell happened? I, I really, really don't want to be in that position right there. It's just get out. Why are you still there? Yeah. Usually people go on too long, and they, I mean this is this is the start of a relationship. So they're they're two weeks in, so it would be easy to get out. But after ten years or whatever, when there's nothing left to talk about, and and the only thing you do is fight or ignore each other, well, people still stay together. Yeah, maybe because it's easy. I don't know. Yeah, and we, I mean, we we sometimes we make a bit bit fun of Fleming that he's a harsh man, that relationships changed for the better. But a lot of this is also pretty recognizable either in your own yeah. life or or in the lives of people close to you. So it's yeah. things have changed, but there are a lot of things that are still the same. Yeah, I think so too. So Fleming goes slightly back in time, back to the morning of the phone call. Breakfast, he says, was an effort for both. Bond is determined to sort out the problem over lunch, and Vesper is very non-communicative, avoiding Bond's eyes, seeming to be preoccupied, and they act in silence. Mm. Now, can you feel... The tension between them, they're not speaking, and then this happens. All of a sudden, she stiffened. Her fork fell with a clatter onto the edge of her plate, and then noisily off the table onto the terrace. Bond looked up. She had gone as white as a sheet, and she was looking over his shoulder with terror in her face. So Bond has a look, and he sees a man, probably a businessman, taking place at a table and Vesper is convinced this is the same man from the car whom she believed was following them. Now Bond thinks the scene is perfectly normal and the man is very innocent. Surely they can't expect to have this in place entirely to themselves. And the man by the way has a black patch over one eye, not tied with a tape, but screwed in like a monocle, kind of like you uh, Tyler. There we go. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was a trendsetter, but no. Yeah, Vesper is still terrified. She's white-faced. She has trembling hands. She drinks some wine. And she's really convinced it is the same man. Now, Bond tries to reason with her, but she tells him she has a headache and she withdraws to her own room. Now, explain this to me. If she has decided by this point that she doesn't want to be involved with Smirsh anymore, or Russia, she should come clean or at least not try to draw attention to this man. What is she trying to do? I'm not sure, but it's... Or is this genuine fear? She probably thinks it's too late, and maybe she's not professional enough to, to hide her fear and just go on. I, I don't... Actually, also, I don't really know what Smirsh is trying to do here, because we don't get that conclusion in the end. We don't know whether they are still after the money. I think they are trying to re-establish contact, because as we find out, in the last chapter or the the letter she stopped writing them and maybe they want to uh, make sure that she's still there and that they're still there and they're trying to get her to reach out to them again hmm. i don't know we are led to believe that everything ends when vesper kills herself right yeah spoiler alert but do you think they were trying to assassinate her i don't know i mean they're after vesper but they don't probably not after the money that bond still has but why but Bond doesn't have the money anymore. No, true, true. So I, I, I don't really know what, what the purpose of Gettler is here. No. Just to frighten Vesper, maybe? that Probably to let her see that they will find her wherever she goes? But she doesn't come clean and she doesn't nope. hide her fear either. So it's... It... It's a bit weird. Yeah. I don't know her motives. But she goes to her own room and Bond then decides to do some investigating. So he has a look at the car of the man. Might have been the same. Maybe, maybe not. He observes the man and everything seems fine. 
So when the man leaves after his meal, Bond talks to the patron of the inn, casually informing after the man, and apparently he's Swiss and a traveler in watches, and the man will be back in two days on his way back. And to Bond, everything seems legit. Yeah, this is the deleted scene from the movie Casino Royale. At the reception. Yeah, which makes the entire story a bit more fleshed out in the movie. It's really a shame that they that they cut that out because it really adds something to this story as well. Okay, is that deleted scene on YouTube? Uh, I think so. I know okay. it's on uh, it's on the DVDs, but it's probably on YouTube yeah. as well. Yeah, I don't have any physical copies anymore of my Bond films. Only the digital downloads. Right. No extras. I I, no I, extras. I presume it's on on YouTube as well because most of those things are. Yeah. I'll have a look for it. Yeah. And then finally, Bond offers to pay for the earlier phone call to Paris, the Vespers call to Mati. But the patron tells him the matter is regulated. By the way, he said, Madame had an early telephone call, which I must remember to pay for. Paris, an Elysee number, I think, he added, remembering that that was Matisse's exchange. Thank you, monsieur, but the matter is regulated. I was speaking to Royal this morning, and the exchange mentioned that one of my guests had put through a call to Paris, and that there had been no answer. They wanted to know if Madame would like the call kept in. I'm afraid the matter escaped my mind. Perhaps Monsieur would mention it to Madame. But let me see. It was an invalid number the exchange referred to. So... After this, I am very suspicious. What is going on here? Because I always assumed that an invalid number, or an invalide uh, number, whatever you want to call it, it's a non-working or an inactive phone number, probably used by the opposition to receive intel or establish contact. But that was just my assumption. It is spelled with a capital I, invalid. It's kind of weird. There is another explanation I found online. It might be true. It says when Monsieur Versois mentions the invalid number, phone number, he's referring to the Hotel Royal des Invalides, an enormous building once used to house France's homeless and disabled veterans. Have you ever heard of that? No. Nope. Les Invalides, as it is commonly called, has served a variety of purposes over the years, including providing office space for the French Ministry of Defense and Foreign Ministries, as well as being the final resting place of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, maybe this tidbit of information about the phone number Vesper called tells Bond she's trying to reach someone working in government. But whose government? Bond can't be certain. But this, uh, this website also says he can easily rule out Mati as the recipient of Vesper's phone call because she didn't call to Paris. Yeah. So he knows Vesper's lying to him. Yeah, but he, he already knows that Vesper is lying to him. So It's just weird. Yeah, but it's, it's nice to have this reference because I, I didn't know that. I always thought that it was a, it was a disconnected number of some, some sort. Yeah, but it's probably that's what this. I assumed yeah. as well. Yeah. Could be this, yeah. Anyway, we're nearing the end. Only two chapters left. Let's move Let's on. Let's move on. Okay, chapter 26, Sleep Well, My Darling. The deterioration of their relationship continues, and on the fourth day of their stay, Vesper goes to Royal to pick up some medicines, probably some sleeping pills or something. Yeah. <laughs> and that night she tries extra hard to be joyful. She drinks a lot, they have ravenous sex, and afterwards Bond hears her crying. And again, decides to go back to his own room. I would too, if, <laughs> if she starts crying. <laughs> it might be good to build an extra room for this, just for this. And back in his room, he hears Vesper go downstairs, probably to the telephone booth again, he presumes. And the next day, Bond and Vesper are having lunch, when the man with the eye patch returns to the inn. Like he would. Yes, like he would, although Bond didn't tell Vesper that. Probably not, no. Bond knows straight away that something is up, because he sees Vesper's face. Uh, well, we we learned that the name of the man is Adolf Gettler. Again, a man in Switzer from Switzerland who works in the watch industry. Vesper directly walks away from the lunch table yeah. uh, and returns to her room. Bond, being the man he is, he first finishes his lunch, of course. There you go. Because uh, priorities. <laughs> yeah, priorities. Get your priorities straight. <laughs> and and after lunch, uh, he joins her in her room. Now he gives her an ultimatum. Either she tells him right now what's going on, or they leave straight away. He probably should have done this a bit earlier. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> so Bond tells her that a couple of days ago he wanted to ask her to marry him. I 
actually feel this is sort of a bit of how do you call it mental not really mental torture but a bit of, of mental blackmail just letting her know like well you're being such a bitch and i actually wanted to marry you but now you've well you've ruined that as well again he, he asked her can't we go back to the beginning can we go back to that day the day that i that i wanted to marry you well Vesper does what she does best crying but she won't tell mm-hmm. bond what is troubling her no. she asks bond to leave her alone uh, because she really needs to think he held her closely to him tell me my love he said tell me what's hurting you her sobs became quieter leave me for a little she said and a new note had come into her voice a note of resignation let me think for a little she kissed his face and held it between her hands she looked at him with yearning darling i'm trying to do what's best for us please believe me but it's terrible i'm in a frightful she wept again clutching him like a child with nightmares he soothed her stroking the long black hair and kissing her softly go away now she said i must have time to think we've got to do something well yeah i like the fact that bond gives her the ultimatum but he doesn't really push through so uh, he gives her the ultimatum she doesn't tell him what's up but they don't leave either so he yeah he, he gives her the ultimatum you either tell me right now or we leave straight away well they don't do either of the two in the evening some of her gayness returns and bond tries his best to go along with it mm. they drink a lot of champagne again that always helps yeah and return to their room to make love well everything seems all right and vesper promised bond that she will tell him everything the next morning yeah they say good night and again bond returns to his room yeah well actually vesper asks him to go away yeah this time she examined every line of his face as if she was seeing him for the first time then she reached up and put an arm round his neck her deep blue eyes were swimming with tears as she drew his head slowly towards her and kissed him gently on the lips then she let him go and turned off the light good night my dearest love she said bond bent and kissed her he tasted the tears on her cheek he went to the door and looked back sleep well my darling he said don't worry everything's all right now and bond goes to his room with a full heart i don't really think that everything is good between them well between them but we are sort of made to believe that they made a fresh start and that they are going to try again yeah so the final chapter so what is going to happen this is like an emotional roller coaster this whole chapter probably what vesper is going through seems like even though what you said is right that bond gives her an ultimatum and she doesn't really give him an answer and then he doesn't follow through with his ultimatum but she does seem to have decided upon doing something and we will find out what that is it's not the best course of action but she seemed to think so bond wants to give it another shot i don't think he he gave up on her yet no and did she did she already decide what she was going to do when she left for royal to pick up the medicines was it already her intention to... no i don't think so no i don't know why she went into town well the, she, she, she says that she's going to pick up some medicines yeah so either she's but she might have is that in a letter has she met with someone has she sent a message to someone no 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 I don't know. Well, let's, it's let's... just in the in the chapter it states that Vesper leaves early in the morning yeah. for Royal claiming that she's going to pick up some medicines yeah so. well might be true maybe not i don't know well she needs the sleeping maybe, pills uh, but she already had those yeah but maybe if they're... you want to commit suicide she need more. probably need yeah, a lot more. more yeah i forgot actually what she wrote about that in a letter let's go to the final chapter sure chapter 27 the bleeding heart so the patron brings bond the letter in the morning he bursts into bond's room holding the envelope in front of him as if it's on fire there's been a terrible accident madame and bond immediately rushes when he hears that to madame's room to vesper's room vesper's door was open the sunlight through the shutters lit up the room only her black hair showed above the sheet and her body under the bedclothes was straight 
and moulded like a stone effigy on a tomb. Bond fell on his knees beside her and drew back the sheet. She was asleep. She must be. Her eyes were closed. There was no change in the dear face. She was just as she would look, and yet, and yet she was so still. No movement, no pulse, no breath. That was it. There was no breath. Sleeping pills, the ones that he saw in the bathroom that first evening, or the ones that she bought the day before. But yeah, Bond takes the letter and he goes back to his own room and he sits on his bed and he gazes out to sea and then he looks at the envelope and it is addressed pour lui, for him. And he opens it and he reads the short letter quickly and then he throws the letter down on the bed as if it has been a scorpion. And then Fleming writes the letter verbatim. My darling James, the letter opened. I love you with all my heart, and while you read these words, I hope you still love me, because now, with these words, this is the last moment that your love will last. So goodbye, my sweet love, while we still love each other. Goodbye, my darling. I am an agent of the MWD. Yes, I am a double agent for the Russians. So, in the letter, Vesper explains how her boyfriend, a Pole in the RAF, the British Air Force, was captured by the Russians and she was blackmailed into helping them, or her boyfriend would die. So, she passed along all the information on his mission, his cover, etc. That way, the opposition could prepare the Munsters, Red Man, Blue Man, and even the kidnapping was staged. So, here we get all the answers that we were asking. Mm -hmm. Did she know about this? And she was in on pretty much everything. And that this also explains what we discussed two weeks ago in the beginning, that why was his cover blown? Yeah. She explained it. She gave the Russians all the information. But then along the way, she was falling in love with James and she didn't want to continue providing the information. And she refused to give any more. And then she also knew that that meant that her lover would die. And she got a final warning that Smirsch would come for her. And she saw the man with the black patch and she hoped to be able to shake him and elope together. She wanted to go to South America and even have babies with James and start again. But there's no escaping Smirsch. According to Vesper, there were only three options. Telling James, but he would immediately dump her, or be killed by Smirsch, or kill herself. And then finally, in the letter, she provides some details for James to be able to go after the Russians. And then she ends the letter that she loves him. And then Bond is mad as hell and he cries and he gets dressed and he goes to the telephone booth and he calls London. He is immediately cold, businesslike. He can only see Vesper as a spy, her treachery and the damage it did. And while he's waiting for the call to get through, he goes through all the facts in the letter and everything that had happened over the past days and weeks. And his mind is made up. He will take on Smirsch and hunt it down. Yeah. And then the final paragraphs are as follows. The telephone rang and Bond snatched up the receiver. He was on to the link, the outside liaison officer who was the only man in London he might telephone from abroad, then only in dire necessity. He spoke quietly into the receiver. This is 007 speaking. This is an open line. It's an emergency. Can you hear me? Pass this on at once. 3030 was a double, working for Redland. Yes, damn it, I said was. The bitch is dead now. And thus ends Casino Royale. What an ending. What are your thoughts, Tyler? Well, I have a, I have a question for you. Do you think this is the spy novel to end all spy novels? No, it isn't. It isn't, because this is only the beginning. Yeah. But it is wonderful that Ian Fleming wrote this. It is an excellent book i think yeah i think so i think so as well but what are my thoughts yeah well like you said it is the beginning and it ends on a gloomy note it does explain a lot i'm not quite sure whether whether knowing this ending whether it would make you want to read the entire novel again right then and there just to see if you can patch it together if you can connect not up. necessarily i think because this last chapter kind of neatly wraps everything up yeah but but like 
when you when you watch the usual suspect for instance for the for the first time mm-hmm. the big reveal is at the end yeah and with a movie like that i always get the feeling okay now i know this now i want to watch the entire movie again to see whether it all mm. makes sense whether it all it all works out knowing the big reveal at the end mm. and maybe i didn't necessarily have that with this book but maybe fleming tried to do that by capturing everything at the end and then yeah well we have read it several times yes True. Um, over the past years, yeah, and still an analysis like this makes you makes you see things things differently and th- make still connect the dots a bit more and a bit better than than I did the first couple of times that I read it. Yeah, it definitely, it really made me reappreciate the entire effort more. Yeah. So, how did you like this third part? If you compare it to the beginning and the middle section of the book that we did, it's almost frustratingly sad. Because they start their relationship happy, but that doesn't take really long. And most of the third part is just their relationship falling apart. And you feel that sense of not having the tools in hand to make it work again, not having the tools in hand to to get back to that beginning. And then you just, you you feel it falling apart. And in the end, well, it it ends with her suicide, which put a damper on, on it a bit more. What I do like about the ending, it is really a downer, but it pulls the entire book back into the espionage genre. Yeah. Because after the intense climax that we had at the end of our our second uh, part all these chapters were you you were kind of wondering where this was leading Mm -hmm. to it's more of a romance story instead of an espionage story and then this final chapter it really pulls it back into that genre and it explains everything that has been happening and it sets up the the beginning of the next book and the next decade of fleming material yeah so now that we went through Casino Royale with a tooth comb, mm. what do you think is the meaning of the word Flemingesque? Because we hear that word every so often, and we even use it ourselves sometimes in our film reviews. But yeah. what does it mean to you? Um, you talked about it a bit already. Well, to to me, it's twofold. I guess to me, it's on on the one hand, it's the cliffhanger at the end of the chapter. So the the yeah. really pushing the story along, not giving you time to breathe, just go on and on and on and on and on. Fast narrative. Yeah. On the other hand, it's the the way that he takes his time to describe things. That It's almost the, the, the counterpart of that. The opposite. Yeah, but it, it works in a in a symbiosis that, that works really, really well to me. When he's describing places and food and history and stuff yeah. like that. And I believe there are there are two th- different things. There's on the one hand you have the, the Fleming nest, which is the fast pacing and the, the, the cliffhangers and the just on and on and on and on and on. Non stop action or non stop things that are happening that makes you want to read on. And then there's the, the Fleming effect, which is learning about new things along the way so learning about a baccarat for instance or bridge or uh, cheating at cards or scuba diving or the way jamaica works so you you also have that you just get dropped into a world that you don't know well on the one hand because it, it was written 70 years ago but also because bond does things that you don't usually do so to me flemingesque is really the fast pacing and the Fleming effect is more the description of things and the, the learning new things and learning learning the way things worked at that time. Yeah, so. yeah, I think you described it well. Yeah, oh. I also found a whole paragraph on the style of Fleming on Wikipedia. I wonder what you think of that. It has a slightly different perspective, which is also good, I think. It says, Fleming later said of his work, while thrillers may not be literature with a capital L, it is possible to write what I can best describe as thrillers designed to be read as literature. He used well-known brand names and everyday details to produce a sense of realism, mm. which the author Kingsley Amos called the Fleming effect. There we go. Amos describes it as the imaginative use of information whereby the pervading fantastic nature of Bond's world is bolted down to some sort of reality or at least counterbalanced. I don't really think that there are that many references to well-known brands and everyday details in Casino Royale as in later novels, but 
Fleming definitely does his best to write his adventure in the real world, or at least yeah. an enhanced reality. But right? I mean, there isn't that many brands uh, in the in this novel, but it's also quite a short novel compared to the other ones. Yeah. So there yeah, is, is less time to put in that elaboration that there is in, in the other novels. Mm, true. But you still get the Ronson Lighter and the uh, Moreland Cigarettes from Grosvenor Street. You get it a bit, yeah. Of course, the the, the dinners and things like that. And, and of course, his Bentley. So there, there, there still is a bit of it. It's there, yeah. yes. You're right, yes. And then the next part from uh, Wikipedia describes something that we have already talked about. It says... Within the text, the novelist Raymond Benson, who later wrote a series of Bond novels, identifies what he described as the Fleming sweep, mm. the use of hooks at the end of chapters to heighten tension and to pull the reader into the next. The hooks combine with what the novelist Anthony Burgess calls a heightened journalistic style to produce a speed of narrative which hustles the reader past each danger point of mockery. Now, I can easily recognize these in, in Casino Royale. We pointed these out as well during our conversations, I think. Yeah, I, I listened to the Raymond Benson Bedside Companion quite a few times. And, and it's really, I, I love that book. It's really a, a summation of the Bond books and the movies and Fleming's life and a biography of Bond. And it's, it really ties it all together. And I, re I really like that book. And he mentions both the Fleming effect and the, and the Fleming sweep. Two different things. Two different yeah. things. Now, yeah. you you also already said... This is one of his shortest books. Um, if you listen to the audiobook version, it's about five hours. Mm -hmm. Whereas, for instance, Dr. No is uh, eight hours. Mm -hmm. I love listening to audiobooks and the bits and pieces that I try to edit into these uh, three episodes are from the version which is read by Dan Stevens. And at the end of his recording of the book, there's a brief interview with Dan on what he thinks. Shall we listen to what he has to say? Sure. I hadn't read uh, this book before. I had seen the film adaptation, the recent one, um, but no, I hadn't. I hadn't read this book. I'd read a couple of the others when I was younger, but not for a while. I really enjoyed it. It was um, the the structure of it surprised me. I, I'd sort of forgotten perhaps what the structure of of the Bond books was, and I don't know if it's the same for all of them, but it's certainly this one is, is very much in three parts, and you have the casino section with the, the intrigue and the, the suspense of this high-stakes game with Le Chiffre. Um, and then it goes into this rather horrible sort of torture sequence, you know, it becomes quite a different book uh, in the middle. And then it gets all sort of mushy and romantic at the end, which I hadn't really associated with, um, with Bond so much. I mean, I know he always gets the girl, but I didn't know it got quite so sort of romantically involved and you know with these questions of marriage floating around um that certainly took me by surprise i think probably the, the oddest thing i i found was the, was the um was the was the romantic section really and this these sort of these long uh, passages of of sort of introspection and and reflection about um you know the nature of his profession and and you know considerations of his future and and you know romantic future and and his happiness and all these sorts of things that I, I always thought Bond was about sort of, you know, covert operations, killing and gadgets and cars. And, and actually, um, you know, he goes for sort of long dips in the sea and thinks about, you know, when he's going to settle down. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think this being the first book that obviously changes in, in later books and perhaps he becomes a slightly more hardened character. Um, I don't know if he does really, then perhaps he doesn't. <laughs> um, I need to go away and read the later ones, I think. But um but that that definitely surprised me that you know that he was a bit of a, a bit more of a softy than we give him credit for in the movies. I think. <laughs> okay, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I, I'm surprised that he he doesn't really sound like a like a Bond fan. If you listen, for instance, to the Toby Stevens does from Russia with Love. Toby Stevens also does a lot of BBC uh, dramatized versions. Yeah, exactly. And of course, is is Gustav Graves. He loves Bond and he really, mm -hmm. really lives and breathes Bond. Toby Stevens is probably of this series my favorite narrator of the books. Oh, really? Oh, I love Bill Nye with the Moonraker. But yeah. Oh, yeah, he does a great job as well. Yeah, true. I'm always surprised to hear that, first of all, that he does such a great job with reading a book that he hasn't read yet. Yeah. I don't think I would be able to do such a great job on that. Oh, no, definitely not. No, me neither. Yeah. I, but I'm quite sure I wouldn't. 
but but I'm surprised, and and he he was probably quite surprised when he because he he knew the movie, but he didn't knew the book. So <laughs> there's then you are in for a few surprises. Yeah, exactly. Definitely, exactly. yeah. <laughs> but as far as I can tell, he hasn't read many of the Fleming books. Well, that pretty much ties in with uh, what I wanted to talk to you next about is um, we went through a very thorough book review now. Would you recommend reading Casino Royale to friends or to Bond fans who only know the films? Is it a good starting point to get into the books because it's the first? Or would you, for instance, think that Goldfinger or Thunderbolt are more accessible? Well, first of all, I hope that everyone who listened to this podcast had already read Casino Royale. Or read along with us. Yeah, read the first part and then listened to our podcast. But probably we give away too much of the of the book and of the plot mm. along the way. This is not a spoiler-free um, no. uh, review. No, no, most definitely not. So I, I hope that everyone who listened to this had already read uh, Casino Royale. I think every Bond fan worth his salt should at least try to read a few of the books. And then, would you recommend Casino Royale? It's a quick read. Yeah, it's a quick read, but it might not be the one that I start with. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If you, if you it's, it's like if you tell someone who wants to see one Bond movie, then I wouldn't recommend Doctor No, for instance. Okay. I might recommend The Spy Who Loved Me or Goldfinger or Casino Royale or, okay. or whatever. So what book would you recommend then? <laughs> It's a difficult question. Yeah, I know my question. answer. Shall I um, sh sh shall I go first then? You can think about it. I, I think I know. Okay, go ahead. Either Moonraker, mm -hmm. Thunderball, or... Meh, I'll just keep it at those two for now. Yeah, I would probably recommend Thunderball. Yeah. Because it really resembles the tone of what people know of the films. Yeah, it's probably the closest to the cinematic bond. Yeah, so it's an easy read that way. And it is different enough, but it sits on its own. It has Spectre. Mm -hmm. And it is also, it gives you a bit more in-depth look at what goes on behind the scenes, sort of say. Where, where does Blofeld come from? How does, the, how does Spectre work yeah. and stuff like that? So it also, it is interesting in that perspective. But I'm also a sucker for continuation. And... I probably would recommend people just to start with Casino Royale and if they like it, continue with Live and Let Die. Mm. And that brings us to the inevitable question. Do you want to do Live and Let Die like we did Casino Royale? Because this is an investment, man. Yeah. This is hours and hours and weeks and months of podcasts preparing and recording and editing yeah um uh, well for, first of all i would love to do uh, i would love to do live and let die however uh, should we do them in order or should we just i think you and i both we've probably read all the books right several times yeah, yeah. including the continuation yeah novels. Well, i i just finished the last benson novel i hadn't done that yet so we could also just pick randomly or semi-randomly the next one so do we want to continue with Live and Let Die and go through the entire Fleming series? Or do we want to pick Icebreaker, for instance, or High Time to Kill, or... Let me think about that. Yeah. Because a project like this takes quite a lot of time, and there are more than 40 books out there. Yeah. So if we're got, just going to pick one randomly, I'm not going to do this every week. No, 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 no. And I won't be able to do this for it indefinitely. I mean, I am going to die <laughs> eventually. <laughs> so I think now, if I have to speak my mind, my preference does lie with the Flemings to at least try and cover those. Okay. And see afterwards whatever we find interesting. But let me think about it, okay? All right. And also, let's ask our readers if they... Uh... Well, if they Listeners. say, don't do this anymore, please stop your rambling. True. Then, uh, yes, we'd love to know what our listeners uh, think of all this. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, we had lots of fun. At least I have. I hope you had uh, too. Uh, yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope that uh, our listeners also had a good time listening to us rambling on and on and on and on. <laughs> but yeah, it was hard work. So um, yeah, it's kind of. I wanted. I want to take this moment to thank you for your thorough research, for all the preparation time that you that you put into it, and it it was really a blast doing this together. Yeah, it was. It was, and I have extensive notes that I go through during the recording and during the preparation, and 
it's almost 50 pages long, so that's quite long. Uh, uh, what I will do is in all the show notes of these uh, episodes, I will put at least the sources up there uh, where we took everything from. And I'm not sure if I should even include my notes. Maybe not. Let's just keep them for ourselves. Yeah, let's not spoil the magic. So that brings us to the conclusion of our three-part book review of Casino Royale. Please let us know what you thought and if you would like us to continue doing this or not. And if you like what we did, please share our podcast with others and contact us at our email address, which is moneypenny at the double That is the zero zero files.com or visit our website at www.thedoubleofiles.com. As always, the double O files will return.